Famous evolutionist J.B.S. Haldane said that evolution could never produce something like a wheel or a magnet. But what modern science is showing goes way beyond that. Stay tuned to find these marvelous molecular machines today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Today on Creation Magazine Live, we're going to talk about design, mm -hmm. amazing molecular machines. And, and it's interesting, evolutionists, uh, folks, all kinds of folks, uh, write into our website and right. say, well, the, the, we're talking about all this design. Well, it's up to you creationists to show us that there's any design in anything. Right. The onus is on us. You know, right. uh, evolution can explain this, that, and the other thing. So we just have to um, come up with... Uh, evidence of design, but it's not difficult to figure out why they don't see evidence of design or they profess there's no evidence of design right? because they follow a, a method of investigation uh, involving what they call methodological naturalism, which means that you will simply interpret everything you see according to a naturalistic uh, evolutionary mindset. And of course, right. that's why you see uh, quotes like this from S.C. Todd in, in Nature magazine. He said, even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it's not naturalistic. Well, guess what? If, uh, if I create a game and I create the rules, and the rules always come out to be that, uh, you know, if you mention God or you mention design or you mention uh, anything like that, then that's not allowed. Well, boy, I wonder whether you're going to come up with only naturalistic uh, yeah, conclusions. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a silly position to take. It's a very closed-minded position to take because right. you're self-censoring any data that points to design or a creation, that there could be a creator. So then the only data that you accept is data that points to philosophical naturalism. Right. Which it, it just so, I mean, doesn't it, work. Think about it. Really, all you're just saying is you're saying, I don't want to believe in God. That's really what you're saying. I mean, that's, if, if, that's the logic, what it is, right, yes. if the logical yeah. conclusion would be, well, yeah, we can recognize design as, as long as it's not God who designed us, then really it's just an anti-God uh, position. So. Um, Anyway, that's why we get people talking about peer review uh, a lot of times, right? Yes, you've had peer that. review. And do you have any peer-reviewed articles? Well, yeah, in, in our peer-reviewed publication, the Journal of Creation. Right. Uh, but that's just creationists. Well, yeah, how are we going to get a peer-reviewed article <laughs> in magazines that only allow evolutionary conclusions? Obviously, it's not going to happen. <laughs> exactly. Interesting. But, but uh, anyway, not all uh, evolutionists are that closed-minded. D.L. Right. Abel. Um, has actually come up with what he calls a null hypothesis. He claims that uh, all evolutionists have to do is nullify certain concepts and then the proposal of intelligent design will be defeated. So he's got a list there of, uh, of things that we need to, basically that, that uh, evolutionists could use to, yeah. to disprove yeah. design. And you can see that list here. Uh, he's mathematical logic, algorithmic optimization, cybernetic programming. He lists all of these things. Uh, so what he's saying is that we, we see, uh, he's, he's saying is we, we see work, language systems, goal-oriented systems, things like that in, in the list that you see here. Right. And uh, natural processes can't explain those things. Well, he, well yeah, he, he's basically saying that if natural processes could explain it, if we can show examples of natural processes creating these types of things, then we'll have disproven the design argument. Right. Right? This, this is what he's trying to say. But um, he's actually admitted that uh, that seems to be a little harder than, than he thought, right? He said, we've spent much of the last century arguing to the lay community that we have proved the current biological paradigm, which is evolution, but they haven't. Unfortunately, very few in the scientific community seem critical of this indiscretion. One would think that if all this evidence is so abundant, it would be quick and easy to falsify the null hypothesis put forward. So he's saying, well, here's a criteria to, to falsify design. And if it was easy to do, you'd think, well, we'd have done we'd it have by done now. It already. Yes. But we haven't yeah. done it by now. And so, you know, it's interesting. We, we've heard this God of the gaps argument from, from people, right? People right. will say, yes. well, you, you know, yeah. you, you guys see something amazing in, in living things. You say, well, God must have did it because yeah. of God you of the gaps. You can't explain argument. it, therefore you invoke God, God of the gaps. Right. Yeah. And sooner or later we'll be able to explain it. But 
if I have an explanation that fits the facts, you don't have an explanation that fits the facts, which one of those explanations is more logically sound? Well, that's really the issue, isn't it? Exactly. So we'll get into this uh, more in just a moment. Stay tuned. When scientists announced the discovery of the Wallamai Pine in Australia in 1994, it caused a sensation. Some reported that it was like finding a living dinosaur because the tree was only known from fossils in Jurassic rocks. That would make it extinct for 150 million years by evolutionary reckoning. Finds like this are actually quite common. When something that scientists thought became extinct millions of years ago is found alive, it's called a living fossil. But living fossils pose a problem for evolution, since the organism has hasn't changed, it brings into question the supposed millions of years age as well as the very idea of evolution. When a tree was planted in London recently, Sir David Attenborough said, it is romantic I think that something has survived 200 million years unchanged. Well perhaps he considers it romantic, but I find the millions of years of evolution very hard to believe. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website creation.com. Welcome back. Today we're talking about incredible systems, living systems that, uh, that really defy evolutionary or naturalistic explanation to account for how they got there. Uh, we're looking at things like ATP synthase. This is just incredible. Right. And uh, ATP synthase is a, is a motor and it's a machine and it's inside every living thing. And uh, if you go to the evolutionary literature, you'll actually see them describe it in, right. in, in that yeah. way, right? Um, Yes, it's described true. this way. Uh, the world's tiniest machine. These things are machines, says Michael Mayer, an assistant professor of chemical and biomedical engineering. It would be amazing to figure out how to make them. Right. Says. So, so uh, look at this, uh, this uh, machine here. It's a 32-part motor. Yeah, it's in the mitochondria of, of every cell. Every living thing on the planet has these motors. It converts ADP molecules into ATP, which if you don't know what that means, basically ATP is the universal life currency of every living thing on the planet. So everything on the planet operates on ATP. Everything on the planet has these, uh, these motors. And so really what we have to say then is without these motors, no life could exist no life, on the planet. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we've got an animation here that uh, uh, just in, in, as a result of, of you know, all kinds of scientific discoveries of how this little motor works, yeah. the world's tiniest motor, uh, only the colors are art artistic license, but everything else is, is as accurate as science today tells us. Have right. a look at this. ATP is produced by a tiny molecular rotary motor rotating at up to 7,000 RPM. These are so small that 100,000 would fit side by side in a millimeter. The current of protons drives the motor, unlike man-made electric motors which use electrons. This portion of the enzyme is where adenosine diphosphate is combined with a phosphate ion in the presence of a catalyst to produce ATP which is then released, making way for the next cycle. The top view of the enzyme shows the sequential operation. Almost every biochemical process in your body requires ATP. Such a nanomachine exhibits all the characteristics of super intelligent design. Wow, that's just amazing to, is, to consider a, a motor inside uh, you know, the cell of every living thing on the planet. So every blade of grass, if you could just somehow zoom down there, and of course this thing's 20 nanometers, which just to give you a size you know, perspective, if you took a meter and you cut it up into a billion pieces, uh, that, that little motor is 20 nanometers, so it, it's microtechnology uh, at an astounding level. Uh, almost every biochemical process um, in your body requires ATP. And so th this nano machinery, this, this technology, this, this ex exhibits the characteristics of super intelligent design. Yes. I mean, we're always yeah. trying to make things smaller and, and more efficient, and, and it's just staggering. And when you consider if all life um, you know, uses ATP and all life has ATP motors, that means it must be essential for the first living thing to come into existence. If you want to argue, right. well, maybe it was simpler in the past, but you don't have an example of it. So that's not science, right? right? You, can't, yeah. you can't invoke that as science. You can invoke that as wishful thinking to help bolster evolutionary ideas. Yeah, really, the, the shoe's on the other foot here. I mean, it's, it's up to the evolutionists to explain how things like the ATP synthase motor could come to be through natural processes. Right. And you can, I mean, you'd have to come up with a, 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 a wild 
speculation about, well, it started like this, and then this happened, and this happened, right. but it would all only be speculation. Exactly. There's, there's so much evidence for design there in the ATP synthase. Yeah. And, and even though some anaerobic bacteria don't use ATP synthase to manufacture ATP, they, they use it to pump protons out of their cytoplasm. So um, they die uh, otherwise. So even anaerobic bacteria use uh, ATP synthase motors to maintain their pH balance. So yeah. what that is, it's a, it, it, even an example of even more sophisticated design because it actually shows how living things can use motors in, in multiple applications. So similar to how we'd use a motor in a lawnmower, we'd use a lower motor in a dishwasher, wh whatever we're, we're using it for. It's just astounding that these, these things, it's, it's just obvious example of intelligent design. Yes. Yeah, so these are the kind of 32 piece motors that we're looking at here. So uh, the question is, what's the chance of a non-living 32 piece motor assembling itself? You know, by itself. Again, we're talking about uh, no creator, no intelligence right. involved in doing that. Even if all the pieces were just of a motor were sitting in your garage, right. and there yeah. was a, an earthquake, would they assemble themselves and turn into a, 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 an operating Obviously motor? Obviously not. Stay tuned for even more marvelous molecular machines. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and evidence for a global flood, scientific arguments that explain observations in astronomy within a young Earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, evidence from biology that shows that the type of change that is observed in living things has absolutely nothing to do with evolution. Got questions? Get answers at creation.com. Okay, we're talking about amazing complexity and design yes. and living things. And one of the, the, uh, uh, the vital themes in evolutionary uh, storytelling, basically, is the concept that life must have started very simple. Yes. and became more and more complex over time. And we, 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 we still read this in, in uh, textbooks today, you know, slowly over many generations, you know, simple-celled organisms became more complex, et cetera, and evolved into more and more, you know, multi-celled organisms and, and, and onward and upward. We, we hear this stuff all the time. Yes. So, uh, so I mean, we, we, we get the picture. Something that has a few components uh, is considered simple, where something that has many components that interact with each other is complex, right? right. It's pr pretty easy to understand, simple yeah. versus complex. Well, l let me give you guys a, a, a scenario here, and then we can just see whether we think it's simple or complex or not. Let, let's say in our real everyday world, we go out and we see somebody working on a machine, and they're working on their machine, and all of a sudden, clunk, 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 it, it, it breaks down. So they do a diagnostic to see, well, what part, you know, broke down, and then they discover the part, and then, uh, you know, I don't know, part J22, whatever it is, right? And so they go, hmm, I need this part to make this work. So they flip open their phone and they, they phone this, this company and say, okay, well, I need this part. So on the other end, somebody goes, oh, okay, well, where's your location? What's your address? And so they copy that down. Okay. Now, uh, at this uh, manufacturing plant, they don't have um, the, the, the blueprint for this part. So they pick up a phone and they phone somebody else and say, well, we need the blueprint shuttled over here. And so that happens, and they bring the blueprint, and they look at it, and they say, okay, well, let's, let's, let's put this thing together. So they put the part together, and then they put it in a bag or a box or something like that, and they write the address down. And then they get a courier to come along, and the courier picks up the, the parcel, and then, of course, he's got the address, so he must have some kind of GPS or map or something like that, knows where to go, and then delivers it to where it's supposed to be. Would, okay. Would that be... Well, that's a, that's a, well, obviously it's a complex system, and you're, you, you had a point behind this story, but <laughs> exactly. that's, a, that's a complex system, right? Many interrelated parts, you, right. you've got uh, communication going back and forth, you've obviously very complex. Databases, you know, for, okay, well, you need this part, so obviously they must have a list of all parts the parts. Parts lists, um, uh, uh, yeah. courier systems, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Even yeah. if you were to automate that system, it would take astounding intelligence and, and intelligent design a technology, computer, all that kind of stuff. Right. So, so, we, so where, where are you going here? Well, <laughs> where I'm going is, uh, is we're going to take a look at, a, at an animation of, uh, of something that actually uh, is going on inside all living things that have any kind of cell with a nucleus in it. Inside a living cell is an amazing transportation system. Proteins have to be delivered to the correct part of the cell to perform their intended functions. This animation, based on a lot of clever research over a number of years, shows how it happens. Highways, made of microtubules, are assembled by interlocking proteins, 
each manufactured in accordance with the coded instructions on the cell's DNA. Marching along a microtubule is the Kinesin motor, the hero of our story, carrying a huge sack of proteins to be delivered to a predetermined place in the cell. Here, the proteins will be released to fulfill their functions. The Kinesin linear motor uses one ATP to provide the energy for each step and takes 125,000 steps to cover one millimeter. Wow, that's, in, that's incredible. Amazing. Right, yeah. so a, a direct analogy to everything I just uh, said in my story there. Right. Um, it's actually even more complicated than that, but actually what's really neat about Kinesin is they are actually run, what fuels them is ATP. So the ATP synthase motor we saw that in the we last just talked segment. about. Yeah, so every molecule that ATP that hits the Kinesin, he takes one step. So uh, without those motors, he wouldn't even have power to run these little molecular robots that are, exist inside of us. So, so there are two, the, the ATP synthase and the kinesin that, that need to work together, two incredibly complex systems uh, yep. that have to work together for life. Again, yep. But it's even more complex than that. Apparently the kinesin can go into sleep mode. Yes, that's when right. It's, not, when it's like C-3PO shutting himself down <laughs> in Empire Strikes Back or whatever. It's, I'm not needed now, I'll just shut down for a bit. Exactly. And the, the microtubules that the kinesin walks on, yep. and I guess the kinesin itself, yep. can be recycled. Right. The, the materials used, you, you build new roads, build new microtubules. And so how does that happen? You know, how, how, do you, yeah. how do you know if the road is going to be used again and or or not and, right. then, and then recycle it and it's incredible and, and like a relay race these kinesin can come along and then pass off pa packages to someone else and then they'll take it the rest of the distance sometimes yeah. the load is too heavy they'll actually work together as a unit to to carry on just just phenomenal truly amazing yep. yep and and they travel so quickly um a hundred steps per uh you know, they're just zipping along. They, they'd be like the flash if they were, you know, upgraded to our size today. So amazing. anyway, just amazing. We'll, we'll look into more stuff when we get back. Scientists have just found out what you always wanted to know. Why do fingernails, when nibbled or torn, tend to tear across the nail rather than downwards towards the nail bed? Well, by analysing nails under the electron microscope, the reason became clear. Nails are made of three layers containing the protein keratin. The keratin fibres have a specific arrangement that prevents breaks from running down the nail and also gives the nail tremendous strength. Without this arrangement, according to one of the researchers, every tear would damage our nail bed, inflicting great pain and incurring infection. A similar pattern is seen in horses' hooves, which is just as well, because if cracks were to run upwards instead of across in a horse's hoof, it could lead to infection, lameness and death. How could anyone say that this crucial design feature of hooves and fingernails has come about by accident? The evidence surely shouts designer. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website creation.com Okay, now you've seen the kinesin, you've seen ATP synthase, incredibly complex biological systems yep. and living things required for life as, uh, as far as we know, even simple life would require that. Uh, now we want to show you something that's truly mind-boggling, as if this wasn't enough. <laughs> the creation of a protein. Right. It's incredible. I mean, we outlined one aspect, right? That the kinesin, that the protein, the part was needed to be delivered somewhere. Yes. And then information got taken and blah, blah, blah. And the kinesin came along and delivered that protein. What about just the manufacturing of that protein itself, that, that part, so to speak? Take a look at this. This animation demonstrates how the digital information encoded within DNA is used to direct protein synthesis. This is a DNA double helix containing the digital code which directs the cell in all aspects of operation. And here we see a protein complex called an RNA polymerase traveling down the DNA strand. As it moves down the strand, it carefully unwinds the DNA, preparing it for transcription. Inside the polymerase, we see a single-stranded copy of the original instructions being assembled as individual bases are positioned and added to the growing strand. A stop code marks the end of the protein specification, at which point this copy, known as a messenger RNA transcript, exits the polymerase and heads towards a two-part chemical manufacturing machine called the ribosome. While the messenger RNA moves towards the ribosome, transfer RNA molecules attach to specific amino acids in preparation for assembly. As the messenger RNA transcript passes through the ribosome,
the process of translation begins. Using the instructions encoded on the messenger RNA as a template, the transfer RNA molecules align specific sequences of bases to corresponding amino acids, creating a protein chain. As this chain exits the ribosome, it is met by chaperones which prevent premature folding, while escorting the protein to a barrel-shaped machine called a chaperonin. This machine helps fold the protein into the precise shape required to perform its function. Although it is unclear how the chaperonin achieves this, we do know that accurate folding is essential in order for the protein to accomplish its intended function. Once the protein is complete, it is released into the cytoplasm to do its job. Truly really amazing. Boy, we've, we've seen today some amazingly complex biological systems on a very, very small scale uh, inside living things. And remember that quote we started with from uh, JBS Haldane there that said, mm -hmm. if, uh, if you, you can demonstrate that a wheel or some, something would, would come about through naturalism, evolution would be disproven. Right. Or, or he, said, he said evolution can't do that. I just couldn't do that. And these are way, way more complicated than a wheel or a magnet. We're talking about motors and robotic delivery men and, and amazing. Yeah, Incredible. now Haldane, he was an older evolutionist, of course. Um, the, you know, he, he wouldn't have known about some of the complex systems we know yes, about today. Yes. But just logically speaking, he could understand that there's no way you could even get there through naturalistic processes, right? Now, we've only been able to touch on a, on a few of these things. And, and we really need to emphasize that the things we've shown would have had to show up in the evolutionary timeline very, very early, right? This isn't something after, you know, three billion years of evolution. We're talking about right. things that would have had to be there, uh, if not at the very beginning, like the ATP synthase, very shortly after in the evolutionary time scale. So um, that, that, that makes it difficult, very difficult for evolutionists to, to explain. Um, I'd really like to uh, recommend a book from one of our, our, our speakers yes. and uh, senior scientists. Um, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. And Jonathan wrote a book uh, a couple of years back called By Design. And it is a mind-blowing book. It's it, just example after example of the, the kinds of things that we've been talking about. Like we, we've right. got animation on these things, so that's why we use them in the show. But there is there's so much out there in God's creation that just screams design, design, design. Exactly. And for evolutionists to turn around and say, well, I can't see design. You, got, you guys show me where there's design is just... Is just uh, yeah. It's an I, argument I, that doesn't hold any I water. I just really recommend you get that book if you just can't see design because it's there. Some astounding things, even more mind-blowing than what we've already showed you now. Stay tuned. What are the theological consequences of adding millions of years to Genesis? How does it impact doctrines such as the gospel, sin, the atonement? Refuting compromise is the most powerful biblical and scientific defense of a straightforward view of Genesis. Loaded with scientific support for a recent creation in six real days, it demolishes all attempts to twist the biblical text in order to insert millions of years, bringing clarity into an area usually mired in confusion. Must reading for Bible college students and anyone involved in church leadership or teaching. Get your copy at creation.com. Okay, we're looking at incredible examples of design. Yes. And, and I want to show an, an example now that, you know, maybe it doesn't really, um, people don't really think about the theory of evolution. You know, yeah, the theory of evolution, every generation there's small changes. If these small changes add up, or, or they provide a survival benefit, then they're retained, and those small changes add up to big changes. And this is what we've heard about That's evolution. That's the story goes. Yeah. Exactly. Now, of course, the I, uh, is an incredible example of design and usually people focus on you know the fact that it's a camera and, and all this kind of thing but one of the things I want to focus on is the fact that there is a um, basically like a pulley design for the eye so that your eyes can can swivel around sure and if you look at the diagram here you'll see that there's a, a pulley like um, like a, a little um, curved pulley and a tendon actually goes through that and there's actually a, a, a lubricating um, uh, 
sac there that lubricates that so that tendon can, can pull back and forth just like okay. a pulley. And that's one of the reasons why your eyes can, can swivel around. So it, it's like a, a tendon going through and, and it pulls back and forth and that's one of the reasons your eye can move. Now I want you to think about something here because I've got a pulley here today, okay? Now you think about, okay, before this pulley system has ever evolved. Right, yeah, how did it get there? How did it get there? Because, I mean, this little tendon, it, let's say it's even attached to one end, right? I mean, so the pulley system has to evolve? Of course, the, 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 you know, the tendon has to go through the pulley for it to be useful. Okay. And it can't attach itself to there. It's got to be completely independent. So somehow this pulley just evolves, but there's no function for it apparently. And then this tendon just somehow comes up and goes through, and then it would have to go through, and then it would have to attach itself at a very specific point where there's a muscle that could pull it. Otherwise, there'd be no use for it. No purpose, yeah. You know, <laughs> people. I remember sitting in school, and they would just show me diagrams, and I'd go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I wasn't thinking, how could you do that, right? Yes. And, and again, yeah. if the evolutionist wants to say, well, you know, just because uh, we don't know how it happened doesn't mean uh, it didn't happen by evolution. Well, I know how things like this happen. They happen when people design them. That's, that's what I know. Right. And to say that it came about by chance, it's a faith position. Exactly. A, and, and, and it goes against all the design that we see in, in for example, design pulley systems <laughs> that you see in cranes or whatever. That's right. From a me mechanical engineering standpoint, it's obviously designed for a particular purpose, right. to, to move the eye in a particular way. Uh, examples like this should nudge people toward understanding God. But uh, Darwinists like uh, Franklin uh, M. Harold, he's Professor uh, Emeritus of Biology at Colorado State University, he says this, we should reject as a matter of principle <laughs> the substitution of intelligent design for the dialogue of chance uh, for the dialogue of chance and necessity, we must conclude that there were that that there are presently no detailed Darwinian accounts of the evolution of any biochemical or cellular system. Only a variety of wishful speculations. Right. So right out of the gates, An honest there, admission. Yeah, he, he's just saying, but we should reject as a matter of principle um, intelligent design, just as a matter of principle. What principle? Yeah. Atheistic principle. It, it just means that you you just you're defying God. That's yes. all you're doing. You're shaking your fist at God. You're saying, listen, I, I'm not going to accept that there's a designer or a creator because that's going to mean, obviously, that you're responsible to that creator. Yeah. Even so, though he admits that there's currently no detailed evolutionary account for uh, how, how to get a these A variety things. of so, wishful speculations. Yes. Atheism is a bankrupt thought system. Well, stay tuned for, uh, come to see us next episode. See you then. <laughs>